Hey, everybody. It is Great Mondays Radio, and we are so excited to have Dr. Brian Harmon on with us today. Brian is an expert in trust, and he has uh, built a number of amazing businesses and really kind of become a professional in this trust building category. And I'm so excited to have you on. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for coming on Great Mondays Radio. Josh, thank you so much, man. I I hope we become good buds after this. I love everything that you're doing, your brand, you, your book, your radios here. This this is just awesome. Thank you. Oh, stop it some more. All right, Brian, give us a little background quickly so people um uh, have a reason to trust you. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I had a what I consider a fabulous corporate career. And from construction to biopharma, over the course of time, I just saw how different these industries and teams and people and leaders operate. Got me really fascinated. I went back to school, did the PhD in leadership, started teaching as a professor, uh, professor, started coaching. And it's led me to do some really cool work with some really cool teams. But my focus has always been on uh, the research and practice of trust, building better relationships. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, as frequent listeners of the podcast will know, and and those who are advocates for culture, trust is the key component, right? So that's not news to uh, anybody here. But what I am interested in learning from you today is kind of all of the most important aspects of trust, uh, the how tos, and what you describe as the economics of trust, which made my uh, bells go off because that is amazing when we want to tie kind of the benefits, the business benefits of uh, actually building these trusted relationships. It's not just about uh, feeling good at work. It's about doing better for everyone. So why don't you kick us off? Tell us kind of the, why don't we start with the bottom line of, you know, what, what is it? What is, what is your definition? And uh, we'll just go from there. Yeah, definition. So trust is, it's a reciprocal emotion, m m much like a smile or a laughter or a, a high five. This is something where you give it and you get it back in return. This happens actually at a biological level in our bodies, the, the release of oxytocin. And there's some amazing researchers out there like Dr. Paul Zak, who's dug way into that field. I would actually really recommend his book if trust is important to you, if leadership is important to you. It's called The Trust Factor, and he's done some other ones, but that one in particular. Uh, he is a friend. We are a small community of trust researchers. But yeah, in a nutshell, it is a reciprocal emotion uh, that stands for intentional. That's a key word here. Intentional accountability, reliance, truth transparency and openness. That's what it is. Mm. Intentional. So you're coming in and you are building this. I mean, I'm sure there's many best friends out there that, I don't know, are they intentional about building trust? I'm thinking about that word. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a, a great example of this. I've got my, my buddy, Let's, for example, say we'll call him Cliff. Uh, he is an amazing friend and he got he has the two components of trust, character and competence. Character being I love him. We we met randomly. It's not like we intentionally found each other out there in the world. Uh, but I just really liked who he is, what he stands for, his personality, his character, how he behaves, how he acts. Uh, but then on the competence side, he's actually just a really good friend. He does all the things that you would hope for in a friend, in a mutually beneficial, amazing, supportive relationship. And so with those two pieces together, character and competence, and by the way, this comes from the brilliant Stephen M. R. Covey, The Speed of Trust book, another recommendation. Mm -hmm. Actually, that book is what inspired me to study trust in the workplace. But anyways, character and competence, those two things together, that is the intention of trust. And I'll give you another example. Uh, I got this friend, Mo. Still love him, all those other things. He's awesome. He's cool. He's great. But he's not that great at being the friend. So he's missing that competence side. So our capacity for trust isn't as high as with Cliff and I. So mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. When it comes in there, it does have to be intention supporting the trust in a relationship. All right. So now I'm, I've got, uh, I've already earmarked a few of those or, or sort of like the descriptions kind of vibrate against some of those relationships that I have in my life. 
And I know that when I have someone that I really like, uh, I got a neighbor down the street, he's just really great. And I, you know, we bump into each other. He comes over sometimes, but just not as good at following through on those things that he said he's going to do. And I don't know what that is, but now I know I can't really, like I can't call on him for stuff. Right. So let's uh, that's, that is a great way to put it. Character and competence. Now at the, in the workplace, you got, there's a lot of people that you have to interact with on zoom, you know, on Slack, uh, maybe even you're lucky enough to have, you know, to actually be in an office, um, but they're not necessarily <laughs> characters that you would want to hang out with, right? You're not vibing. It's not like your best friends. So how do we bring this in? I mean, I can come in, right? Like, obviously, um, you know, I think we've got a bunch of high performers that are, you know, part of our communities and listening and they're like, yeah, I'm going to be really intentional about this. So I feel like we can bring that competence in, right? Do what we say and, you know, read the four agreements or maybe there's five now, five agreements, right? Of like doing what we say we're going to do, but we have to interact with people that we wouldn't necessarily hang out with. How does that, how do you work through that if that's if that's 50 percent of the equation yeah that's i love how you put that and look trust can be felt at different intensities too there's a low form an average form and a high form i would say in the workplace though uh, and this is because of the economics of trust if, when there's high trust things move faster at at lower cost and so you should focus on this if you're in a workplace and you care about your career you care about being a good leader good manager uh, the other part about the workplace is every interaction is an opportunity to either build, degrade, or keep trust neutral. So just being aware, that's a mm. huge part of this. That's that intentionality. I always crack up because uh, I'm i am obsessed with LinkedIn and I do all these LinkedIn polls and I, I ask people, for example, how often do you use humor at work? And people will self-report and I'll look at thousands of the results and it says 70 to 80% of people use humor at work, but, but the reality, the real empirical research on it shows it's more like 10 to 20%. Same goes for things like how often uh, people give feedback or uh, any other type of thing that I'm trying to measure. So that means that we, we think we're doing better than we're doing out there. Mm. And so I would just take a real inventory. What are you doing to build trust? Uh, where are you at now? Ask your colleagues about it. Uh, that would be thing. Number one is, is take that, stock on where you're at. Mm. Number two, if you do want to build more trust, you you have to be the one that opens up. There's this huge disparity between who we are at home and who we are at work sometimes. And that's an artificial barrier. Uh, pe people aren't stupid though. We can't be fooled or BS. Uh, if you're all business and buttoned up and there's not that personal kind of person at work who you are at home, I would just say, how's that working for you? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not great. Maybe not terrible. But mm -hmm. definitely not in that magic zone of, wow, I'm, I'm in this place at work where we've got a culture that I'm really super proud of. So um, I think a lot of folks, I'll go to the far end um, and, and say a lot of folks are protective. Um, I think there was a kind of moment where we felt like, oh, you can bring your whole self to work. And um, I don't think that turned out to be true, or at least not in most organizations. I think uh, folks get dinged um, intentionally or not. And so what I'm inferring from your commentary is allow for a little more openness, and maybe you can kind of try that on. And if you can op be a little more open, soft, receptive, humorous, that you're going to be able to build that trust um, with other people in the, in the office is that, what do you think about kind of that statement where it was, it, it people don't want to, because they're going to get, you know, they're going to, they're going to be, you know, be, be, you know, uh, kind of n not, they're going to get bad negative feedback for that. Right. Like there's that piece of it. It's not going to be a hundred percent yourself. Yeah, it's, it's I appreciate your question. It's it's a a constant battle. Trust is when you give other people the power to hurt you but they don't. And so what that looks like is like every time I've 
been in a, a job on a team in a department or working with other stakeholders within a business, I've done the the full scale. Hey, this is this is Brian. Yeah. And full Brian doesn't work for everyone, and yeah. and that's also okay. Uh, as a business owner, I actually try to push people away. So one of my strategies on on LinkedIn, for example, this 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 will correlate to the workplace too. I purposely post a lot of personal content. So people that don't like me and never will work with me, just stop following me. Stop stop engaging with this. Just get out of here. And then the people who are into it and people who like it, when it resonates with people, I want to bring those people all the way in. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you'll get a little bit of polarity there. Uh, but what I've found is that I would rather give people that power to hurt me and not work with me or not like me than to just be in that kind of neutral halfway zone. Mm. Yeah. I do want to point out that I think there's a lot of um, y- you and uh, I would say I are in a particularly unique and let's say powerful um, space in society where we can um, put that. We, we don't, it is not as risky for us. And I think there's a lot of people out there where it is more risky, whether they're, you know, emotional feeling, emotionally vulnerable, um, or whether it's like, no, I need this job. I'm not going to risk, you know, pushing away my manager, bringing a hundred percent of myself in. So is, uh, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just sort of, uh, sort of foreshadowed this in my previous statement, but is the right, like, how do I approach that if I'm not, I don't have that opportunity or that standing where it's like, I'm going to be a little more open and then see how that goes. Because a lot of people have been hurt, right? That's why trust is hard is because they they have been hurt. It, and and so when I show up at at the at work, um, you know, you have a gift and I have a gift. We can be a hundred percent ourselves um because we have that confidence. And, you know, if they don't like it, screw them, whatever. So is that an approach? And again, I'm just making this up on the fly, but like what would you advise someone who's you know, first job, second job, or, you know, financially in a tentative space, right? Where it's like, okay, I want to create trust. Brian's telling me I need to show up. I'm not ready for a hundred percent. How would I do that? Yeah. So trust is a, something that occurs on a few dimensions. We have self-trust with ourselves. We have interpersonal trust. We have team trust, organizational trust, institutional trust, global trust, I would just start at the first basic one, self-trust. Why? Examining why is it that I feel I have to put up these barriers at work? What, what's what's happening? What happened to me? What is the reason for this? When you start to dig a little bit deeper into that stuff, you start to realize, okay, hmm, maybe Josh and Brian are onto something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into this a little bit by starting slow. I'm going to experiment a little bit. And then when you start to have that interpersonal trust with the people around you at work because you've opened up a little bit stage by stage, step by step, you're going to start to see these things relating to the economics of trust. When when trust is low, the economics mean things move slower and take less. There's uh, more friction. Yeah, there's more friction. So they take longer and they take more resources. So an example of this, just like my wife, Christina, we've been together for almost 20 years and we're madly in love. We I, I love her to death, all that stuff. Uh, and we have a beautiful young son named Benny, who's seven years old. There he is playing basketball, if you can see that. When we first got together, the smallest decision was very taxing emotionally. Where are we going to go to dinner on Friday? Where are we going to go out on Saturday? What are we going to do here? When are we going to buy our first property? Those were very difficult decisions early on in the relationship because there was lower trust. So it was a longer decision. It was emotionally taxing. And then over time, you build up that trust, build up that trust. Now things move real quick, real fast, and there's no emotional tax involved. Same thing with your work relationships. It's like when I'm working with someone, and there's a a bit of inherent trust in our relationship because I know your brother, Benjamin, who is a wonderful, amazing human being. When there's that kind of uh, trust in a relationship at the foundational level, you're going to do some things for that other person. Number one, you're going to show up on time. You're not going to let them down. There's going to be a, a a want or some type of intensity to like desire higher levels of trust in the relationship. That's called admiration, the most intense form of trust. So when I have that for someone, I'm going to bring 
my A game. Every time we go to a meeting, I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to bring my agenda. I'm going to bring any questions, all the stuff that I need to do, like for this chat right now. And when there's not trust, that's when you have things like cancellations and poor meetings and lack of organization and structure and just a lackluster overall thing. So for those people to, to answer your question directly, give this a little chance. Uh, Mr. Rogers has this beautiful quote. It's something I live by. There isn't anyone you can't learn to love once you know their story. Mm. Grabbing a cup of coffee with someone and asking about, hey, tell me about you. This is one of the most beautiful interactions. And I, I teach a course called Storytelling for Leaders, where by the end of the course, when people have to get up there and do their personal introductions, people are laughing and crying and hugging. There's lifelong relationships being made in that room because mm. we just got a little bit beneath the surface. The, the gate of vulnerability has opened up and it's a really comforting place. You feel it in the air. That's It's like that feeling of psychological safety that it's like, hey, they they led by example. They showed me that openness is great. I'm going to, I'm going to open up a little. Mm. Yeah. So one of the, um, big challenges that I've observed in kind of our pandemic and then post lockdown world is the degradation of those relationships that have kind of suffered from, um, Yes, from from a lack of trust. And it's something that I've identified, and it's one of the most popular talks that I give on how to rebuild trust and relationships in distributed workplaces. And my, and I want you to critique my hypothesis, because we no longer have those opportunities to get to know one another beyond the work, Right. Everybody has that experience. You just jump on Zoom. There's no, hey, hi, how are you? It's we're just back to back Zooms. Hey, let's just get moving. So we don't have those interstitial moments. We don't have the proverbial water cooler. And so now you are seeing all of that kind of bleed away. And I, my fear is that leaders see the lack of innovation and efficacy of teams that are distributed and come to the conclusion that it must be inherently because we're remote and you have to come back into the office. So there's that's kind of my observation and then my uh, the driver of that, like those are the symptoms and then what's behind that and then my fear on the other end of what's going to happen. So what do you think about, have you seen this? Is this something that, um, yeah, to tell me what you think about my my hypothesis. Yeah, it's clearly intuitive and, and I've seen it and felt it. The one thing I want to get across about trust is that it's not like one big thing happens and, oh, we got this great trust. We had the coffee and we did the shorty. It, right. it, it's a bunch of tiny little interactions. They add up to this cumulative gorgeous thing that feels really good. Uh, there was a, a cool quote. I think it came from that Aristotle study by Google where they were looking at the best teams and what are the five mm -hmm. elements that they're most hype. Yeah. So the explicit planning and intention of having time for the real check-ins uh, this can be frustrating in a remote environment because if I'm doing a 30-minute check-in with my boss every single week in the month, that's four meetings per month. And we're going to do that, hey, how you doing? But hey, really, how you doing? Uh, that can be a little frustrating if it's every week. But if you just instead wipe those out, do a 90-minute meeting once a month. So it's actually less time because four meetings in 30 minutes would be two hours total. So one 90-minute meeting, maybe over lunch, have – the sharing of food, even if it's virtual, like, hey, we're going to do this over lunch and actually have that explicit personal catch up for 20 minutes before you dive into the rest of the meeting on the work stuff. Mm -hmm. I think that 20 minute conversation is way more valuable than the substandard, non-authentic, uh, hey, how you doing? Oh, good, fine, busy once a week. That's that's really bad. I call it the high trust hello is never answer the question, how are you in under 50 words? Give people a real step into your life for a second. And when you do that, 
because trust is reciprocal, then when you ask it back to the other person, they're going to give you a lot more than the, oh, yeah, I'm fine, busy. So just those little things, uh, mm -hmm. you have to make the explicit time for that stuff. We're not having the little, like you said, the water cooler check-ins or walking past someone around the corridor or down in the courtyard of the cor corporate campus. I used to love up at, up in my last job, just walking the campus Waving to be, oh, what's up? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? That was so great. Uh, and we'd stop and have coffee. Hey, you got time for a little uh, cup of tea or something? Or, oh, hey, come sit with us. We're having lunch. It just doesn't happen. So uh, there needs to be a real strategy. And I think that making it a little bit less frequent, but more intentional, more genuine, more authentic, sitting down for those real things. Instead of asking, how is your work? Catch me up on this project. Managers should be asking, how are you feeling about your work? Talk to me. Mm. those types of things uh those those are going to be the trust building behaviors of a manager and like you said that's the the trust i mean that's that's right like how do you create those moments where you're able to actually hear their story and listen to what they're really make that psychic connection and 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 that's when you can start to build the relationship back to where it was. I mean, it requires a lot of energy and effort and it used to just kind of happen and maybe not even all that well, but it did happen when we were able to share the square footage, you know, of the floor, floor plans. But, and like you said, walking around campus or whatever it might be. So now it has to be more intentional. And I think, I guess my question is what role do managers and leaders play in this, because you and I have been talking about very individual trust building um, amongst friends, amongst colleagues. But now, tell t what are your thoughts on if I'm a manager of a team of 15 or if I'm a leader of a business unit, what can I do to encourage trust building, whether it's in person or distributed or hybrid. This is this is the best question ever. Positive public praise. Publicly reward the people verbally that are doing the trust building things that you know are good for the team and the group or the business unit or whatever. Uh, that can look like at the end of a meeting, doing a very specific shout out to some specific behavior that someone did that then becomes a group norm. When I see behaviors being rewarded and recognized, I'm going to start doing those behaviors. And that's, uh, I think, the the easiest thing a manager or a leader can do that doesn't even require anything but speaking up with that positive public praise at the end of maybe every other meeting that you do or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, is more proactive measures like the uh, individual development plans, uh, adding more personal meaning and collective impact into the lives of the people around them at work. And... The, those those should involve some type of a quarterly coaching conversation, but I can't stress the importance enough of informal feedback is is just, I think, the best way that leaders can uh, build trust in the workplace. Because well, when you do informal feedback, it's from a place of care, a place of love. Uh, relationships get better as a result of feedback, but public positive praise sets new group norms. Yeah, I would 100% agree. And... Um, I've learned that not everybody loves public praise. How do you assess introverts, those who don't when I I because I I that's where that's the assumption I came from, right? I'm an extrovert. I'm like, of course everybody wants public praise. Give it to me, right? And then, you know, I've had clients that are like, yo, this person over here, like, what are we do? like? That's actually detrimental. Now, I mean, I get your point, right? Public, you're exposing it. So that, how do you, how, what might you do for those who on your team who don't, let's say, appreciate public praise as much as others might? Yeah. If it doesn't, a lot of people don't even know if someone doesn't like public praise and that's the yes responsibility of the person who doesn't like it to do some private constructive feedback to the people who are doing that, of course. But I think uh, it doesn't have to be verbally out loud in a public setting. It can also be done via email. Uh, it can be adjusted to to suit certain people. Like, for example, it can be, 
a, a simple statement like, hey, Josh, when you asked me about the importance of trust, I almost had to tell you, I'm going to lower my volume because this is going to get me excited. Thanks for bringing up a topic that's meaningful to me. That That's enough. That That's enough positive public praise that yeah. it, it doesn't have to even go beyond that. It's just yeah. a statement that's specific enough. I think, um, hey, great job. That's not what I want to see because – I don't know what to do with that information. Like what was great? When, when did the great thing occur? Was it this with this? I need the specific action so I can do something with that information that you're giving me. Right, right, right. What's the, isn't there an acronym specific, measurable, um, actionable, relevant, timely, smart, something like that. Yeah. Specific feedback in this context, I, I just believe it has to do with the, the way we process information that the, the neocortex brain is is like trying to say well what how is this going to impact my future what am i going to do with this information if it's specific and detailed yeah. i can now do some calculations in my head yeah. i can say okay that's uh, i'm going to learn from this i'm going to grow from this um whereas the general stuff is just like mm -hmm. yeah, right exactly exactly um another uh, method for praising people in public without it being um terribly terrifying for introverts would be on, you know, some kind of messaging platform. So if you have a team channel for Slack, right. Um, even emails, copying the manager, those are, those are a nice in between because you do lose a little bit of the benefit when it's, I, I am a huge fan of that one-on-one -on -one pat on the back. Hey, thanks for stepping up for speaking up because that person's going to do it again. But then you do lose that, um, the benefit of kind of amplifying it amongst the teammates because the goal, yes, you want to encourage that individual, but the goal is to get change norms amongst the team. So I've seen the Slack work. Um, it's kind of a nice thing. And then even if you can add a little, I've um, some of my clients, um, if we refresh their values, they created new little value emojis based on their, you know, whatever their organizational character is. Right. And so it becomes this kind of like fun little thing, um, you know, with gifts or whatever, you know, it's like, there's a lot of ways to do that. And as long as, like you said, you're attaching that specificity, then we're starting to really cook in that, you know, trust building way. Yeah. I will tell you, this was a, this was an exercise I did for years on LinkedIn is I'd have a monthly calendar reminder at the end of each month, like the fourth Friday of every month. And I would just think back, what are the top one or two most impactful interactions I had? I'm going to go write them a LinkedIn recommendation, something that's going to live forever on their page, give them some good career equity there. Uh, and I also would take the time to write a eight to 12 sentence, meaningful, thoughtful, good recommendation. And I, I, hope that uh, more people will do that because again, I'm obsessed with LinkedIn and I think the social trust and collective credibility there matters. Yeah. yeah. Um, public phrase doesn't have to actually be public. It can also be private because those behaviors will continue regardless. And eventually they can catch on on nor as norms that way. Yep. Um, the, the other thing I would say about, positive praise. Uh, it doesn't matter when it happens. Now, mm. private constructive feedback should happen in a more immediate sense. You have a meeting, something went wrong, talk about it immediately and formally. Don't, don't do it in a written format like a review, but a nice conversation with someone, hey, I saw this. Can we chat about it? Uh, and that should happen timely. It's important because I don't want to know that you've been sitting on that constructive feedback for me for a week or a month. Positive praise doesn't matter when it happens. I might email you in three weeks and tell you how much I love doing this conversation. And that actually amplifies its impact. Whereas if I told you right after this call, like, of course, like we're still reeling on the, the great energy and the, the chat that we had. So just, just keep that in mind. Doesn't matter when, it doesn't matter how, so long as it, it happens. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, let's let's move into and you mentioned the economics of trust so we've talked about the speed of information is that kind of where it starts and ends when it comes to trust like what you were saying about your relationship with your wife when you 
have that trust, you can make decisions quicker. I mean, is that ultimately the kernel of this idea, the economics of trust? You're just going to be able to move your team to make decisions faster. Yeah. In a high trust team, you can move faster with less resources. Resources being business inputs, time, money, equipment, whatever, budget on a yep. project. Yep. Uh, if you take one project team that has a hundred grand, why can they do something faster and cheaper than a team with a $120,000 budget uh, and more yeah. people on the team? It's, it is about the trust, uh, especially in project teams, the, the synergistic effect of a more circular sort of non-hierarchical uh, structure, it, it matters a lot in trust as well. Uh, so yeah, if there's low trust, it just takes more time, takes more resources. You don't move as quick. And it's well, it, in business that that lagging sense can have detrimental effects if they're compounded. I've worked with a lot of executive teams um, that get mired down in approval processes maybe, um, and they have to bring more people in. Is this a function of low trust or is that something else? Yes, 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 yes. I hate to bring this up, but uh, what happened after 9-11? Uh, there's, there's way less global trust. So what do we do? We institute all these high security standards. That's the same exact thing as extra approvals in the workflows and processes by leaders. They're approving it because they don't trust you. And leaders' responsibility is a couple of things. One is to move the responsibility and, and authority down so that they're less involved. And the other thing is they're supposed to be a leadership factory. You want to create the environment in which you are fully replaceable because you will never move up if your team can't take over your role. So uh, the back to that whole line about when you give others the power to hurt you, but they don't. I want the people on my team to make those decisions. Yeah, there might be a little buildup to it as you're developing that trust in the relationship. Maybe you start with this level of approval and then you increase that to this amount of whatever. Mm. But the trust in workflows has a lot to do with that, Yeah, sadly. Yeah, I mean, do you, can you talk a little bit about um, conflict aversion? Because that, and I've, and I've thought about this a lot, which is I feel like a lot of, Believe it or not, American companies, Americans who are supposed to be so brash and so rude in the corporate workplace, it's just, it is a, to me, it feels like an endemic problem of, of avoiding that, what you just said, right? That specific, timely, um, the challenges. It's like people don't want to have that. And I'm, 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 in on one sense, I'm like, yeah, of course. But in the other, I'm just so flummoxed as to why this has become so pervasive. Yeah. Conflict aversion is what stymies all the best things in business, like creativity, innovation, people feeling good at work. And I actually am a big fan of conflict. I think healthy conflict is is what moves things forwards. Uh, you don't even have to think about this in work sense. Like what what moves governments forwards and and our whole world is usually some type of overcoming conflict, managing conflict. But in the workplace, uh, a lot of my success in my corporate career came by taking a hard line on certain topics. Maybe I was that unpopular opinion, but I knew that there was a reason for it. And I, I backed it up. I told some good stories. I earned influence and, and buy-in and approval uh, because I was in a state where I wasn't afraid of conflict. And when you're not afraid of conflict, that's because of a high trust relationship. Right. If I'm if I'm around a boss who I'm tippy toeing around and walking on eggshells and I can't really speak up or give him or her feedback or any of that, that's conflict aversion and that's terrible. But in the high trust environment, me and my boss, we're jamming. I can I can be straight and I can take that hard line on certain topics. I I, I think I I do think there is something to being um uh af afraid of or scared of conflict. But I actually think it's more than that. What what have you observed is kind of behind that fear of of confrontation or conflict? Because I have some of my own observations, but you, you know, it, it's just to me, it's not just I don't like conflict. It's to me, it seems like there's something behind that. There's beyond that. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think that the the climate at work, like how we feel at work, this lower psychological safety, that feeling of when we are putting our reputation and career at risk because of things we say, that's cultivated in a, a environment where a leader is not building high trust. These are not transformational leaders. Yeah. You know, the Primal Leadership book by Dr. Daniel Goleman, the, the godfather of emotional intelligence, this really cool idea about having a, a balance between our concern for people and a concern for results. That's what a leader's, one of their top strategies needs to be around. And I don't want to be on a lovey-dovey, touchy-feely team where nothing gets done. No, I want to be on a winning team where they demand excellence, but they do so from a place of personal care. Mm -hmm. Those those balances, I think, are, are really necessary. And in the environment where you have a balance for concern and for people and a concern for results, it's okay to push back. It's okay to start conflict in that that healthy tone because there's good trust and I feel like I can actually speak up. I've been in meetings early in my career where I've totally hesitated or I'll just keep my mouth shut and then someone else says five minutes later the thing I was thinking of five minutes ago. That's that's really sad that that's how we feel, but it is all because of trust. So I'm going to add a layer onto this that um, you've already implied, which is that um, maybe it's glo global societal moments. And I, um, I've i seen, I, uh, a few years ago, I got the chance to work with um, an organization, a global organization, and the CEO um, was the right CEO at the right time in that he was, he um, leaned into that first part, the balance of personal and results. And during the um, shut lockdowns, he said, no one is going to lose their job and built incredible amount of trust over an organization of 8,000 people. And that was, people are like, they just felt so enamored with that gift and, and like, oh, I can do my work. And that's not to say they didn't struggle, but my, my, my thought here, combining two of your observations or two of your frames is there, is there a time, or it, I think, that there's a moment when, you know, I guess maybe during equilibrium, yes, you're right. It's personal and business results. But during that time, the business results, of course, like that was, he said, no, we're not going to fire anybody. And he earned a ton of trust by leaning into that personal. Now, I think the challenge is he's not great at leaning into the results. And so is avoid conflict avoidant, but he was the right person at the right time. I'm going to extrapolate that and say, there's there's moments when you need to kind of dial that in and balance that in a little bit different ways. Yes, you need to keep both of those in line. But, you know, sometimes you have to put energy or or resources into the culture. And sometimes you have to ask them to kind of burn them, you know, burn the candle at both ends. And that feels like a really important aspect of this model that you're offering. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the average. So at any given moment, static in time, I might be in coaching mode. So I'm only caring about the person or it's March, 2020, the pandemic's going nuts. I'm going into crisis mode. So I'm way on the exact opposite end of the spectrum, but averaging out over the long term, you want to be on that balance. Hey, I care about people. I care about results. Yeah. yeah. That is actually the definition of transformational leadership. I have learned so much. Uh, Dr. Brian Harmon, thank you. Amazing conversation. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to make this time get you on. Um, if y'all want to learn more, I'm going to put uh, his link is linked in in the show notes, but you can find him uh, H A R M A N on LinkedIn. That's his platform of choice. And uh, uh, Brian, amazing. I learned so much. Thank you for coming on Great Mondays Radio. Thank you, Josh. My pleasure.